Let's talk about the respiratory system. So where does air go when you are breathing in? Well, it's going to start out in your mouth and nose. We probably already know that. And then from there, it's going to encounter this flap called the epiglottis. And the epiglottis, its job is to make sure that things go to the right place. So for example, when you eat, you don't want your food to go down into your lungs or else you're going to aspirate or choke. And when you breathe, you don't want your air to go into your stomach because that's not good either. So usually your epiglottis is going to be covering your esophagus, which is your food pipe. And then when you eat, what's going to happen is it's going to flip and it's going to cover your trachea so that no food gets in your lungs. So in this case, we're talking about breathing. So the epiglottis is going to be over the esophagus and the trachea is going to be open. So air is going to go down into the trachea. And from there, it's going to branch off into two bronchi. And the bronchi are going to further branch off into bronchioles. And so the air follows one of these bronchioles down, down, down until it hits a dead end. And this dead end is called an alveolus. An alveolus is just a little, a little pouch of air, really, really tiny. There's a whole lot of them in your respiratory system. Uh, and they're covered in capillaries. So these capillaries are here from the circulatory system to pick up oxygen so that eventually you can bring this oxygen to all your cells. So oxygen is going to diffuse directly through the alveolus into the capillary. Oxygen is nonpolar, it's just O2, right? So it pretty easily diffuses. It's nonpolar and it's small, which are both good for diffusion across membranes. And this oxygen is gonna be carried by a protein called hemoglobin, and we'll come back to hemoglobin and talk about it a lot more. But for now, I wanna talk about what is our impetus to breathe? What makes us breathe? And the force that makes us breathe is negative pressure. So the way that we breathe is we have this big muscle called the diaphragm, and we've got some other muscles. We've got intercostal muscles between our ribs, and we've got accessory muscles, which are like up by our collarbones. But the main big muscle that's going to help us breathe is the diaphragm, and that's this thing down here. And it's a big old muscle, and when it contracts, it's going to pull down. And when it pulls down, it's going to pull the lungs down with it, and these lungs are going to expand. And now we've created an environment that has just as much air as it did before, but now it's got less volume. So if we look at our old friend, the ideal gas law, this stuff is all constant. We're not changing the number of molecules in our lungs, right? We're not changing the gas constant because it's a constant, and we're not changing the temperature. But what we are changing is the volume. So if the volume goes up, what has to happen to the pressure? Well, what happens to the pressure is it goes down, so the NRT can equal the same thing that NRT equaled before. So what this does is it makes pressure lower inside the lungs than it is outside the body. And just like in diffusion, how molecules like to go from high concentration to low concentration, air likes to move from high pressure to low pressure. So air is going to move into the lungs until pressure has been equilibrated. That's how we get new air in our lungs. When we're ready to breathe out, the diaphragm is going to relax and that's going to push it back up. And now suddenly our lungs have high pressure because what we did is we lowered the volume, right? The volume lowers, what has to happen to the pressure? Well, the pressure is going to go up. And the air still wants to go from high pressure to low pressure, so it's going to head right outside the body, and the whole cycle starts again. So how do we know when to breathe? Because sometimes we're gonna be breathing faster, like when we're exercising, and that's when we need more oxygen, or sometimes we're gonna be breathing slower, like when we're sleeping. So how do we control this mechanism? Because, I mean, it's not always voluntary. We can't be thinking about it all the time. Well, what, control, what controls it is this thing called the bicarbonate buffer. And this has to do with blood pH. If you don't know about buffers, you might want to watch my video on pH or uh, crack open a textbook and refresh yourself about buffers because here we're about to dive into one that's very, very important. So a buffer has to do with an acid and its conjugate base and the equilibrium between them. And why are we talking about carbonic acid all of a sudden? Because as you know, we breathe out carbon dioxide. And guess what happens when carbon dioxide combines with water? Well, we get 
carbonic acid. So because of this, the more carbon dioxide that we have in our blood, the more acidic it is, right? Because of Le Chatelier's principle, if we add more of this, that's gonna shift the equilibrium this way and shift this that way, right? Well, what happens when our blood gets more acidic is this blood actually interfaces with the cerebrospinal fluid. And this is the stuff that's like in your head and in your spine that your brain is soaking in, just like the name suggests. So what happens with that is that this acidity makes its way to the brainstem. And the brainstem controls all of our very basic functions that we don't always have to think about voluntarily. And it's going to send signals to the diaphragm Oh, we need to breathe faster. We've got too much CO2. And so here's a little cycle that shows how this process works. And now I want to go back to something that we mentioned briefly before, which is hemoglobin. And this is how we carry oxygen and also how we carry CO2. And also how carbon monoxide can be carried, but we don't want that. That's going to kill us. Anyways, so hemoglobin is made of four subunits, two alpha and two beta, and each one has this thing called a heme, and heme is iron that is associated with a lot of different amino acids. And this iron is positively charged, so when oxygen binds to it, oxygen has a lot of electrons, so that makes sense. It's going to be attracted. And hemoglobin's got something called cooperativity going on, and cooperativity says that when one oxygen binds, all the rest of the hemes really want an oxygen even more. So normally, if we have a protein that's binding something, it's going to be kind of similar to an enzyme that's catalyzing something, and this goes by uh, Michaelis-Menten kinetics. So with a Michaelis-Menten curve, we would normally be looking at uh, concentration of substrate and velocity of the reaction, and it would look something like this, right? Well, when we have cooperativity going on, it looks a little bit different. It's going to look sigmoidal, so it's going to look kind of like an S, and this is the curve. So we're looking at the pressure of oxygen because that's kind of the same as concentration for a gas. And we're looking at how quickly it binds to hemoglobin. Now some stuff can happen with this curve depending on things in the environment of the hemoglobin and also like what kind of hemoglobin it is. So for example, this is what happens when the pH lowers is that hemoglobin actually does a worse job holding onto oxygen because there's more CO2. So if you have low pH, hemoglobin binds less oxygen, and if you have a higher pH, then hemoglobin binds more oxygen. The other one that's kind of interesting is fetal hemoglobin, which actually binds oxygen better than adult hemoglobin. Because say you have somebody who's pregnant, right, and that person's got a placenta and that placenta is gonna interface a bunch of stuff with the fetus. And one of the things that the fetus needs from the parent is oxygen because the fetus can't breathe, right? So the fetal hemoglobin is actually gonna have higher affinity for oxygen because when you have adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin interfacing a couple cell layers away across the placenta, then you need oxygen to want to get off that adult hemoglobin and go over to the fetal hemoglobin. So this would be the curve for fetal hemoglobin is it's actually higher up or shifted to the right. So that's how hemoglobin works and I hope you have a little bit of a better sense of what happens with the respiratory system now. It's not a lot of stuff actually. A lot of the stuff can be lumped in with the cardiovascular system which I'm also going to post a video on so check that out. But thanks for watching. Don't forget to breathe.